Hello, my favorite sixth graders. This is your favorite teacher, Mr. Jacobson. I'm excited to be with you. Today, we're going to talk about the origins of Hinduism and Buddhism. One of them is, uh, is created through a blending of cultures, and the other is created by an individual who was seeking answers to life's suffering. Let us begin. So, first off, we're going to talk about the Indian uh, society. So, when the Aryans uh, came down uh, through the uh, through the Ganges uh, River Valley, and the Aries the Aryans started to uh, marry and intermingle with the Harappan, who were nearly wiped out, but they uh, they migrated across. India. So Harappans who sort of migrate across India, they're going to mingle with the Aryans and the Aryans are going to create a, a very complex society uh, known as the caste system. And with each of these castes, as you can see, you have the Brahmins, Satria, Vaisya, the Sutras, and then at the very bottom, which is even outside, I want, this is the caste system. So untouchables, they're they're um, they're worth noting, but they are not in the caste system. They are completely separate. They are dejected from society, or I should say, Indian society. Okay. Now avarna is the different levels. So avarna would be Brahmin. Another varna would be Satria, Vaisya. Sutra, etc. So if you think of levels, just think of Varnas as well. So Brahmins are priests. That's what they do. Their job is to uh, to uh, understand and teach the uh, Vedic texts. They can teach it to other Brahmins or to Satriyas. Satriyas are rulers and uh, and leaders and even warriors. And they're at a very high class as well. The Brahmins are definitely the most respectable in the caste system. Satriyas, though, for the most part, have all the power or have the majority of the power. So this, uh, this caste system doesn't necessarily tell us who's the most powerful, but it tells us definitely who was the most respected in the society, and that would be the priest or the Brahmin. But the Satriya would also be the, the ruler's if you will, and the Brahmin could teach the Satriya. However, Brahmin could not teach the Vaisya. So the Vaisya were farmers, craftspeople, uh, businessmen, people who would trade with money. Any kind of exchanging of money would uh, fall in line with the, uh, with the Vaisya. Um, and then the very bottom of it, caste system would be the Sutras, these are laborers, non-Aryans, servants, even slaves, etc. And then at the very bottom would be the untouchables. Unfortunately, the untouchables, uh, once they once they're kicked out of the caste system, they can't do any. They can't move up. See, the caste system is so rigid because even there are definitely levels, as you can see, but even marrying had to be done within that level. For example, a Brahmin had to marry a Brahmin. If they married a Satya, a Vaisya, or a Sutra, then they were in jeopardy of becoming an untouchable. An untouchable means that both you and the person you married lose your, your Varna, and you are no longer even recognized in Indian society as part of the caste system. Um, untouchables uh, did not... Uh, did not sit or eat or even really be in the same area as these people. Um, they even had to walk around smacking sticks together so people knew the untouchables were coming their way and they'd get out of the way. Um, untouchables became untouchables by either intermarrying or doing a job that was considered forbidden. Uh, one of them would be a great example would be working with leather. As you know, working with uh, cattle was, uh, well, I should say, the cattle to the Aryans were almost, were holy, they are sacred. Uh, so if you're te 
touching dead cowhide, then that would make you an untouchable because you're touching something that is dead and holy. It was considered holy. So untouchables, not a great place to be. Uh, once and you once you are an untouchable, your children's 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 all the way down will forever be an untouchable as well. So here's the caste system. Caste system divided in Indian society, groups based on the person's birth, wealth, or occupation. Individual caste should be lost or increased, but was rare. Could not marry anyone from a different caste. People who broke caste rules could be banned from their caste to become untouchables. So you have it in writing in case you want to look it up there. So we have um, we have Hinduism, which starts to emerge out of India. So what is Hinduism? It's the basic principles of what is known today as Hinduism were already formulated by 1500 BC. They were to be found in the four Vedas. Now, the Aryans believe in many deities who control the forces of nature and govern society. Hinduism is the blending of cultures between the Aryans and the native Indians who were Harappan. So the Aryans and the native Indians, a.k.a. Harappa, them combining their culture created what we now know today as Hinduism. So what is early Hinduism? Hinduism grew out of the religious customs of many people over the thousands of years. Hindus tend to think of all deities as different parts of one universal spirit. This universal spirit is called Brahman. In its earliest form, the worship of this spirit is sometimes called Brahmanism. Upanishads. So, the search for a universal spirit is described in the ancient sacred text known as the Upanishads. Those writings say that every living being has a soul and that wants to be reunited with Brahma. Brahman, and that this happens when a person dies. The Upanishads describe how a person unites with Brahman. A soul that becomes one with Brahman is like a lump of salt thrown into water. The lump of salt is gone, but the water tastes salty. The salt has become part of the water. So that's how the Upanishads uh, explain when a soul finally gets to be reunited with Brahman. It's like you being the salt and Brahman being the water. Uh, when you merge together, you kind of disappear as though you're not a, a lump anymore, but you kind of mix together in with, with, uh, with Brahman and become one. So here are the Vedas. So the Vedas, the Aryan uh, religion was based on four Vedas or sacred hymns or poems. The oldest of the Vedas is called the Rig Veda. And Vedas describe how to sacrifice and to perform secret rituals. So these are what the Aryans brought with them as they migrated into the, uh, into, um, the Ganges River Valley and spread throughout India. <clears throat> so Hindu beliefs. They're polytheistic. Uh, believe they believe everyone has a soul or Atman inside them. Reincarnation uh, is the belief that a soul is born and reborn many times, each time in a new body. So the Hindus believe in reincarnation in that. Uh, when you die, if you don't reach the ultimate level to be reunited with Brahman again, then you would come back to Earth. And depending on how good you were a person, depended on the kind of species you would come back as. Would you come back as a human, as an animal, or something lower? And as you can see, the, here are the major gods, Brahma, Shiva, and Vishnu. There are so many other gods, and to call them the major gods, 
I mean, I'm sure some people, you know, especially my experts might be screaming right now saying, no, that's not right. There's so many other gods or more major or whatever. And, and, and so be it. But at least three of these gods, they are definitely major. Shiva is definitely important in, in, uh, in, in Hindu, um, Hinduism. So you have the three here, okay? And then you can see the, the cycle. Here's the baby. They're growing up, and then they're getting ready to die, and then they die, and they get reunited with uh, them again. And according to if they were good enough, the, re the, uh, the cycle changes. If not, then it, it continues again. Dharma, to earn the reward of a better life in their next life, Hindus believe that they must perform their duty. Dharma is the divine law. It requires people to perform the duties of their caste. A farmer has different duties than a priest, and men have different duties than women. So it's this idea that if you do your duty and do it well, then, uh, then you will uh, be rewarded, and that maybe when you die, uh, you will, instead of being a sutra, um, you will come back as maybe a Brahmin or, or a Satriya. Karma, the consequences of how a person lives are known as karma. Hindus believe that if they do their duty and have a good life, they will have good karma. This good karma moves them closer to the Brahmin in their next life. How did the belief in reincarnation affect Indians? For one thing, it made them more accepting of the caste system. People believed they had to be happy with their role in life and do the work of their caste. A dedicated Hindu believes that the people in a higher caste are superior and that they are supposed to be on top because that's where they were put when they were reincarnated. The belief in reincarnation gave hope to everyone, even servants. If servants did their duty, they might be reborn into a higher caste in their next life. Jainism. I'm just going to touch upon Jainism. Uh, the founder's name is Mahavira. He gave up his life of luxury and became a monk and established Jainism. Jains live by four principles. Injure no life and tell the truth. Do not steer, steal and own no property. Let's talk about a man named Siddhartha Gautama. So Siddhartha was a rich, handsome prince who lived within the palace walls. He visited outside the walls and saw beggars, illness, and suffering. He was upset because he was unaware of all the suffering. So we have a new person. He's eventually going to be called the Buddha, I mean the enlightened. And he's, uh, he's actually a prince in ancient India. And he is uh, concerned when he goes outside the city walls of his palace to see people are suffering. And, it, and, and the story goes that this really concerned or, or, or hurt him. Okay, here you have death, here you have people starving, and he's having to see all this. So he left his kingdom to search for the answers like, why do people suffer and how is it cure, how, how to cure it? It began, uh, he began, it is said he began meditating for 49 days till he reached enlightenment or nirvanas, which another word for enlightenment. He taught followers and was called the Buddha or Enlightened One. He taught about the Four Noble Truths. Life is full of suffering. You got to know that. People suffer because they desire worldly things and, and, uh, and self-satisfaction. The third one is the way to, the, to end suffering is to stop desiring things. The only way to stop desiring things is to follow the Eightfold Path. Here's the Eightfold Path. The Eightfold Path is know and understand the Four Noble Truths. Give up all really things and don't harm others. Tell the truth. Don't gossip. And don't speak badly of others. Good advice. Don't commit evil acts like killing, stealing, or living an unclean life. Do rewarding work. Work for good and oppose evil. Make sure your mind keeps your senses under control. Practice med meditation as a way of understanding reality. What Buddha excluded from Hinduism. So these are some of the differences between Buddhism and Hinduism. One, Buddhism 
They don't believe in the Vedas. Second, they don't believe in animal sacrifice. Third, Brahmins or Hindu priests were not necessary for reaching enlightenment. So Buddha said, look, you don't need, to, you don't need these priests to, uh, to help you reach enlightenment. I'll show you how to do it, and you can just do it yourself, pretty much. He rejected Hindu rituals. He rejected the caste system. Missionary work. Buddha's followers spread their teachings after his death into China, Korea, and Japan. Buddhism spread quickly because it was popular and easy to understand. Asoka. Asoka was a powerful king in India that converted to Buddhism. He built Buddhist temples and schools throughout the India. He also helped spread Buddhism across outside of India. Buddhism spread throughout all of Asia. Asoka was a big part of why Buddhism spread outside of India into what we now call China, Korea, etc. But as with all religions, there, is a, there was a split. Not all Buddhists could agree on their beliefs and practices. Eventually, Buddhism could uh, uh, split into two branches. One is called the Theravada. They believed that they had to follow Buddhist teachings exactly as he stated them. Or the Mahayana believed that other people could interpret Buddhist teachings to help reach nirvana. Today, each group has millions of followers. The Mahayana, however, is by far the larger group. It's not even a contest. Here's a group of Theravada Buddhists. As you can see, they're very strict. They, uh, they are following Buddha's words to the exact word. And that's pretty much it. So go ahead and write your one-page summary. And I look forward to seeing you at the first of the week. All the best.